ask you to listen to the dance? Oh my god, I bet it was priceless. <laughs> It was my senior year of high school. My final chance to make it to the state level of the IHSSA competition. My freshman and sophomore years, I performed solo improv, group improv, and theater acting. But I never made it beyond the district level of the contest. My junior year, I switched things up by adding a short film to the mix, but it proved to be a far bigger failure than my previous attempts, and completely shattered my ego. And now, senior year, I was facing the morbid reality of becoming a complete and utter failure throughout the entirety of high school. If I tried my best, my absolute best, with three years of experience to learn from, only to lose for the fourth and final time, it would have been confirmation that not only was I a talentless loser, but I was incapable of improvement. I needed a win here. So, when the time came to begin production on my final short film submission, I knew I needed to take that shit seriously. I needed to think critically about my past failures and incorporate those lessons into one last hurrah. Well, this is the one, this is the ace and hold. This is what, this is the last hurrah. If I fail this, I die. I die in a bed alone. And folks, it actually paid off. My senior year, my short film made it as far as it could possibly go in the competition. So today I want to take a look at my winning film and dissect what exactly I did differently to make it better than the abortion that was my previous entry, $5. Before we watch the film and discuss the scenes, I want to give you the rundown of my creative process as I prepared to write the script. When $5 failed, there were a number of lessons I learned. Lesson number one. Unless I'm playing an obnoxious asshole, I'm a shitty fucking actor and have no place as the lead role in a film. Especially if the lead role is supposed to be a nice, normal guy. My expertise is in playing loud, rude, hateful incels, like Vincent the Atheist. Which is why I think the only scene that even halfway worked with my acting in $5 was the date scene when I had an emotional breakdown. You ordered a $5 football! The rest of the film was horribly dragged down by my inability to act, or even fucking speak coherently. The story I'm telling you today takes place in November of 2011. So how would I fix this? Easy. Write a movie that revolves around a character played by somebody else! And play to my strengths by giving myself the much smaller antagonist role, where I can easily play up being a big asshole. I immediately decided my best friend Biggs, who was a pretty decent actor as far as high school students go, would be the perfect fit as the protagonist of this new film. He was large, in charge, Mexican, and not afraid to make himself the butt of a joke for the sake of comedy. In other words, he was every 17-year-old director's dream protagonist. Ooh, that was good. Ooh. Lesson number two. Voiceover narration is the laziest form of storytelling in a visual medium like film and completely contradicts the tried and true storytelling paradigm of show don't tell. Voiceover narration is bad enough on its own, but when combined with my horrible acting and speech impediment, it becomes nuclear cancer. So how would I fix this? There are many solutions to this, but I chose the one that happens to be one of my favorite genres, mockumentary. A scripted film pretending to be a real-life documentary. 
Utilizing this genre, characters are able to narrate their lives with an actual in-story narrative purpose. In $5, my character was narrating to no one. The narration existed outside the world of the film. My character wasn't telling this story to another person and then we were watching his story unfold visually on screen. So, you with me? It was, yeah. We're, we were at, uh... You actively napping? I, I was, I, I, I drifted. Where did I lose you? Elevator in Switzerland. He was literally talking to nobody. But in a mockumentary format, the cameraman becomes a character. The narration has a purpose within the film because the protagonist is explaining his life to somebody who is asking about it. Imagine if The Office wasn't a mockumentary and the characters weren't being constantly filmed by a camera crew. And all of the scenes where the characters are talking directly to the camera, answering the cameraman's questions, were replaced with voiceovers. Not only would it be somewhat baffling and probably a lot less funny, but as an audience, we would lose a lot of the connection we feel to those characters because there would no longer be a narrative reason why they're telling us their inner thoughts. So the solution for number two is easy. Make the film a mockumentary. Toby is in HR, which technically means he works for corporate, so he's really not a part of our family. Also, he's divorced, so he's really not a part of his family. Lesson number three. Wholesome stories with good moral lessons are not in my wheelhouse. The cringiest part of $5, for me at least, was the forced inclusion of a preschool level moral lesson. Utterly despicable. As many of you may know, my greatest art has focused on darker subjects. School shootings, incel rage, violent revenge, mental illness, the darkest depravity a man is capable of when he feels as though the world is out to get him. That's what my film needed to be focused on. These things that genuinely interested me. Not fucking gay ass shit like, here's my creed, do a good deed. Oh, fuck that shit. My strength is creating a narrative about a person whose life is shit, who reaches their boiling point and finally snaps. So the solution for number three is easy. Embrace the edge, but keep it PG-13 to avoid disqualification. With all these lessons in mind, I went to work on the script. And now that you understand my thought process going into the film, let's give it a watch. So, without further adulture, let's check out A Person of Culture. project thing. Forgot that was today. Wait, how'd you get in my house? Alright, I think the best way to talk about the choices I made for this film will be to compare them to what I did in five dollars. And here in the first 30 seconds, we have a very different mode of operation for disclosing introductory information the audience needs to know. The film begins with an ugly two-second title card that doesn't serve as the title card of the actual film, which is titled A Person of Culture, but rather an in-universe title card for the school project the cameraman is making. We then have Nick W, our clearly socially awkward, probably autistic cameraman, letting himself into Zeke's trailer. He doesn't knock, he doesn't say a word, he just goes into Zeke's bedroom where he's sleeping and films the guy. Zeke's retarded brother Bradley runs into the room to wake him up by screaming about dinner, and Zeke notices Nick with the camera and realizes it must be for the cultural project that evidently they agreed to collaborate on beforehand. This is all the information we can infer from the first 30 seconds, and none of it was told to us. Instead, we are shown what is happening by watching it unfold. Just for fun, here's how this scene would have been if I made this film in the style of $5. Hi, my name is Nick. 
Welcome to my cultural project for sociology class. Today I will be recording a day in the life of a Mexican student at our school, Zeke Kingsley. His day begins at his home in the trailer park, where he is woken up by the screams of his younger brother. Do you see how childish that method of storytelling is? It's this goddamn narrative spoon feeding. I hate it. And to just address something in the comments of the previous video, some dumb fucker said, Monkey rants about show don't tell, tells us everything he did wrong instead of just showing it. You motherfucker! I know you were probably kidding, but just in case anybody takes the bait, there is a difference between storytelling and analysis. You wouldn't write a short story the same way you would write an essay. Well, unless you're fucking retarded or something. We ain't dealing with show don't tell with these videos. These are motherfucking beer paragraphs, son. Belief statement. Example. Explain the example and explain why this example is relevant to your thesis statement. Maybe after I finish this four-part series about my failures as a creative writer, I'll make a video or two about how to easily get an A on any high school level essay. Let me know if you guys are interested, because I can make this shit easy as fuck for you in like 10 minutes. Anyway, back to the film. Wait, how'd you get in my house? When is it time for dinner? Zeke, when is it time for dinner? Zeke, Zeke, when is it time for dinner? Just get out! Man, he wakes me up every morning like this, asks me about dinner. It's every single day, even when we're at dinner eating. We just don't know what's wrong with him. So, uh, do you just want me to tell you about my day? Alright, well, I usually start by getting ready for school the same way every day. I take a shower, get dressed, you know, normal stuff. I wanted to create a sense that Zeke was living in poverty, and was also responsible for taking care of his mentally unwell brother. In a few moments, Zeke goes into direct verbal detail about these things, but we also provide a few visual details. For example, Zeke sleeps on a bed without a sheet, and during breakfast, Zeke and his brother are eating a handful of tortilla chips. Now here's where I fucked up. We were actually filming at my buddy Cobb's trailer, or at least it was his trailer back in 2012, and Cobb had a pretty big collection of DVDs right next to his bed, and for some reason, I didn't think to move it so it wouldn't be in the shot. So now this character living in abject poverty has a $2,000 DVD collection by his bed. Haha, <laughs> boy, I sure do hope somebody got fired for that blunder. The shower water is always cold because my mom refuses to pay the gas bill. She hasn't been going to work lately because of panic attacks, so she doesn't really leave her room, only to go to the bathroom. I haven't seen her for like three days. My dad? He's, uh, I don't know where he is. I've never met him. Here, during an interview segment with the cameraman character, Zeke gives more details about his life of poverty and how he's basically forced to fend for himself since his father isn't in the picture and his mother stays locked in her room due to mental illness. Personally, I like the choice of the cameraman literally nodding the camera to suggest a yes answer, like he's too autistic to actually speak, but when I showed this movie to Sheepover, she laughed and made fun of it. Fucking women, am I right? So I guess let me know in the comments what you think. What, Bradley? Oh, he got suspended last week, so he's been staying home. Otherwise, I'd have to walk him to school. My locker's down by the weights class now. It used to be up there in the main hall. But they moved me so the cheerleaders could be next to each other during homecoming. I'm usually late now, but oh well. At least I get to be locked partners with my best friend Levi. So, hold on, what's that freak doing following you around with the camera? Well, he's doing a research project on some of another culture. I love him following me around for a day. Yup, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got myself into this situation. Well, it all started when I decided to play a dual role in this film. Okay, sort of. Whenever I'm not on camera, I'm the one recording. And when I am on camera, one of my friends takes over. So I guess technically I play one and a half characters in this movie. Well, 
uh, technically, uh, nah. Here I play Zeke's asshole locker partner and apparent best friend, Levi. Is my acting any better from the previous year? I'd say yes, probably, but I would still classify it as bad. Well, I was doing a research project on somebody of another culture. I'll let him follow me around for a day. <laughs> because you're Mexican, right? So what, it's a 24 hour long movie of tacos and chalupas? <laughs> don't you? Oh, oh, Zeke, do you have any gum on you? No, I don't have any gum. Whatever! He asks me every day if I have gum. I never have any gum. I don't know why he keeps asking. Yeah, sometimes Levi takes stuff from my locker and forgets to give it back. Hey, Mr. Williams, can I borrow a pencil for class today? Yep. Just don't lose it. Alright. What's with the camera? Oh, uh, he's doing a video project about my life. About your life? Yeah. So it's basically just an endless stream of burritos and quesadillas? This is probably my favorite joke from any of my high school films. It really shows the comedic absurdity of how much life shits all over Zeke. First, his asshole locker partner makes the joke, which is essentially a two-in-one joke about being fat and Mexican, and then his teacher makes the same fucking joke ten seconds later, but with two different Mexican foods. It fucking kills me. And now I know what you're thinking. But, Mumkey, you made a short film about a fat Mexican who gets bullied in high school? But isn't that literally the plot of your book, The Triflers, which is now available for purchase in paperback? hardcover, and digital ebook download? Links down in the description? Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd say that's all pretty accurate. We usually start out class reading our books. Hey! Quiet over there! Oh, her? She's nobody. Well, I mean, she's somebody. Her name's Alyssa. Huh? No, I don't like her. Come on, we're gonna be late. So it's lunchtime now, and uh, I usually hang out in here because I don't have any lunch money in my account. Levi? Oh, the table he sits at is usually full, but that's okay. This is the only time of day I get to myself. This scene in the bathroom actually wasn't part of the film I submitted for the contest. The contest had a strict five minute limit, and my final film ended up being five minutes and 15 seconds. So ultimately, I decided to cut this brief scene from the film. I think it's a useful scene, but perhaps redundant. Here we see Zeke spending his lunch period in the bathroom for two reasons. One, he has no lunch money because he's poor, which is a detail we already know, so it's redundant. And two, his supposed best friend Levi never saves him a seat at their table, giving us further insight that Levi isn't a good friend to Zeke. Which again is redundant because we've already seen Levi punch Zeke, mock him, shut the locker in his face, and steal his pencil. Personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with a bit of redundancy if it's true to character and provides more details about a character's life, but at the end of the day, I couldn't think of 15 less important seconds in the film, and something needed to be cut, so unfortunately, the IHSSA judges never got to see Zeke react to something disgusting he saw in the bathroom. What a shame. Anyway. Now we're just a little over halfway through the film, and I'd like to discuss the structure of the story. Because this isn't just a slice of life anime where we watch characters go through the mundane motions of their daily lives. That's just the trick. That's the conceit of the film. It's set up to be nothing more than just filming a day in the life of a character. And up until this point, everything has been the setup for the drama that will unfold in the final act. The first three minutes of the film give us everything we need to know. Zeke's life is horrible. He's poor. Everyone, from his only friend to his teachers, treats him like shit. His family has a history of mental illness, and he evidently has a crush on a girl in his class. Now that all of this has been established, all of the ingredients have been brought together. We can now combine them to create a delicious stew of absolute cringe and vengeance. Anyway, here's the rest of the movie.
Yo, Zeke, you know that winter dance that they're having on Friday? Well, I was talking to Alyssa Mitchell today in government, and she said she wants you to ask her. You're full of it. No, I'm serious. She said she's tired of dating jocks and that you're really cute and nice. Really? <laughs> yeah. Huh. So, uh, I'm trying to gather courage to go ask Alyssa out on Friday to the dance. I, um, I've never asked a girl out, so I'm kind of nervous. I bought them from Target. They were like $8. I love them. Hey, hey Alyssa. Hi. Um, Zeke, right? Yeah, you look nice today. Um, thank you. Is that all you wanted to tell me, or...? Do you want to go to the winter dance with me? Oh, gosh, Zeke, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I already have a date. I'm going with Levi. Millard? With... With Levi? Yeah, I'm really sorry, Zeke, but we have a lot of homework to do. Come on, girls. <laughs> Did you ask him to listen to the dance? Oh my god, I bet it was priceless. <laughs> Anyways, now that school's over, I'll go home and show you how to make dinner. Come on. Now that's what I call a motherfucking PG-13 school shooting, folks! Zeke pulls out the pencil his teacher gave him after Levi stole his, and uses it to stab that lying fucker right in the chest, complete with a shitty sound effect. In fact, while I'm thinking about it, there were two sound effects in these final scenes that I chose to use. You may have noticed the film doesn't have a score. There's no background music or anything at all because I wanted it to feel more real to life. Like, there would be no reason for the cameraman to add music to his school project. However, I felt the need to include a suspense sound effect for the scene where Zeke snaps, which ultimately contradicts all the other choices I made in the film. It sucks, because on one hand, I think the sound effect really drives home the mania Zeke is feeling in the scene, but on the other hand, it doesn't make sense given the pre-established rules and structure of the narrative. I'm still pretty conflicted about the choice, so I guess I'll leave it to you guys again. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And then obviously, there's the shitty pencil stabbing sound effect. A sound effect needed to be there, I think, but man, does it sound shitty plugged into this scene. The realism is kind of ruined because it sounds like a stock sound effect, and that's because it is a stock sound effect. I guess if I were to do it again, I either would have found an effect that sounded more realistic, or I would have just left the sound out entirely and let the blood splatter on Zeke's face do the talking. And in case you're wondering, yes, I do my own stunts. I told Biggs to legitimately throw me against the lockers as hard as he could, because I wanted it to look real, to sound real. And as my heroes at Jackass have always said, pain is temporary, film is forever. Now I know what you're all thinking. But, Mumkey, I don't care about the film itself. What I'm really here for is the original view count it got on YouTube and the blooper reel. Oh, okay. Well, you'll be excited to know that A Person of Culture had a lifetime view count of 346 views. And for some reason I didn't make a blooper reel, but I did find this in my files from a day on set. This is my friend Brandon. Hold on. He's of a different race than we are. I'm white. He's kind of white. But even though we have lots of differences, we do have one thing in common. That's love. <laughs>
<laughs> so that was a person of culture. My senior year submission to the IHSSA speech competition. And still to this day, I really like this movie. I think it holds up well. I like the characters, I like the humor, I like the format, and clearly I like sucking my own dick. But the judges liked it too. So much so that they gave the film top scores, and for the first time ever, I made it from the district level of the competition to the state level. I was so fucking happy. <sighs> but I need to get something off my chest. As I explained in the previous video, the IHSSA competition had three levels. Districts, then state, and then if you're really good, the state judges declare you a winner and you get to perform at the all-state level as a champion. And over the course of my last two videos, I've been a bit deceptive with you. I kept saying over and over again that my short film made it as far as it could possibly go in the competition. And I wasn't lying, but the truth of the matter is, since short films were a brand new experimental category, they were at the time ineligible to make it to Allstate. And the state level of the competition was the end of the line. So technically, in a way, my film did win just by making it to state and earning high scores there as well, but my dream of proving my worth, proving my artistic superiority, by performing at the all-state level, seemed to be nothing more than a pipe dream. Just kidding, motherfuckers! It turns out my senior year of high school, I did make it to Allstate in the group improv category. Remember that guy who couldn't find his $5 at the bowling alley? And that girl waiting in line at Culver's? Well, the three of us formed an improv trio supergroup and we fucking crushed our way through districts, through state, and made a big auditorium full of people laugh at Allstate. Unfortunately, there isn't any footage of our performances, as I believe cameras weren't allowed, but god damn it, we did it! As high school came to a close, it seemed as though everything was gonna be okay. And then, the depression came in. And the cystic acne. And, for some reason, I developed extreme social anxiety in college and didn't make any friends the whole time I was there. But you aren't here to learn about my pathetic life. You want to hear about the four short films I've entered into film contests. And folks, if you thought it was all gravy from here on out, you're sadly mistaken. Because the following year, me and my high school friends entered a nationwide competition called the 48 Hour Film Contest. And let me just say, I probably peaked in high school. The film we produced is 50% decent and 50% so fucking bad it makes $5 look like Citizen Kane. But more on that next time. project thing. Forgot that was today. Wait, how'd you get in my house? When is it time for dinner? Zeke, when is it time for dinner? Zeke, Zeke, when is it time for dinner? Just get out! Man, he wakes me up every morning like this. Ask me about dinner. It's every single day. Even when we're at dinner eating, we just don't know what's wrong with him. So, uh, do you just want me to tell you about my day? Alright, well... I usually start by getting ready for school the same way every day. I take a shower, get dressed, you know, normal stuff. The shower water is always cold because my mom refuses to pay the gas bill. She hasn't been going to work lately because of panic attacks, so she doesn't really leave her room, only to go to the bathroom. 
I haven't seen her for like three days. My dad? He's uh... I don't know where he is. I've never met him. What, Bradley? Oh, he got suspended last week, so he's been staying home. Otherwise, I'd have to walk him to school. My locker's down by the weights class now. It used to be up there in the main hall. But they moved me so the cheerleaders could be next to each other during homecoming. I'm usually late now, but oh well. At least I get to be locked partners with my best friend Levi. <laughs> hey, fatso! <laughs> Hold on, what's that freak doing following you around with the camera? Well, he's doing a research project on some of another culture. I'll let him follow me around for a day. <laughs> because you're Mexican, right? So what, it's a 24 hour long movie of tacos and chalupas? <laughs> don't you? Oh, oh, Zeke, do you have any gum on you? No, I don't have any gum. Whatever! He asks me every day if I have gum. I never have any gum. I don't know why he keeps asking. Yeah, sometimes Levi takes stuff from my locker and forgets to give it back. Hey, Mr. Williams, can I borrow a pencil for class today? Yep. Just don't lose it. What's with the camera? Oh, uh, he's doing a video project about my life. About your life? Yeah. So it's basically just an endless stream of burritos and quesadillas? We usually start out class reading our books. Hey! Quiet over there! Oh, her? She's nobody. Well, I mean she's somebody. Her name's Alyssa. Huh? No, I don't like her. Come on, we're gonna be late. So it's lunchtime now, and uh, I usually hang out in here because I don't have any lunch money in my account. Levi? Oh, the table he sits at is usually full, but that's okay. This is the only time of day I get to myself. Yo, Zeke. You know that winter dance that they're having on Friday? Well, I was talking to Alyssa Mitchell today in government, and she said she wants you to ask her. You're full of it. No, I'm serious. She said she's tired of dating jocks and that you're really cute and nice. Really? <laughs> yeah. Huh. So, uh, I'm trying to gather courage to go ask Alyssa out on Friday to the dance. I, um, I've never asked a girl out, so I'm kind of nervous. I bought them from Target. They were like $8. I love hey, hey Alyssa. Hi. Um, Zeke, right? Yeah, you look nice today. Um, thank you. Is that all you wanted to tell me, or...? Do you want to go to the winter dance with me? Oh, gosh, Zeke, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I already have a date. I'm going with Levi. Millard? With... With Levi? Yeah, I'm really sorry, Zeke, but we have a lot of homework to do. Come on, girls. Anyways, now that school's over, I'll go home and show you how to make dinner. Come on. This movie's really gay. You're really gay. <laughs>